Church, I'm Allie McNeese, the middle school ministry assistant, and it's my joy to welcome you to worship this morning. Before the service gets started, I wanted to remind you about the outdoor night of worship coming up on Friday, August 20th. Come early for fellowship food and inflatables at 6 p.m., and then we'll begin worship at 7 p.m. We hope you'll join us for this special night as we worship our Savior and King. Also, there are still opportunities for you to be the church and serve the body of Christ here at Canyon Hills. Some of you might be a little nervous to serve with a new ministry. Hey guys, I'm so excited to be your life group leader this year. I'm really looking forward to a great year. Whoa, what are we doing? What are we doing? Whoa, whoa, whoa! Hey guys, I'm so excited to be your life group leader this year. I'm really looking forward to a great year. Whoa, what are we doing? What are we doing? Whoa, whoa, whoa! No, no, seriously. Leading a life group isn't that bad. Student Ministries is the best. So come and join us. As someone who works with students on a regular basis, I can assure you that it is such a joy and so rewarding to work with the next generation. To serve at Canyon Hills, you can visit one of the booths outside in the lobby, sign up on our app, or visit canyonhillscommunitychurch.com slash serve. We'll help equip you to faithfully serve others to the glory of God. That's all I have for today. Now let's lift up the name of the Lord in worship. Good morning, church. Let's all get to our feet and sing these words together. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging seas. My God, He holds a victory. Come on, let's sing it.
I love getting to come together and to sing songs like that that remind us of the joy that we have in the Lord, that we get to lift up His praises each and every week. But it's not lost on us that every single week when we come into this place that there's a whole lot of life and a whole lot of different circumstances and situations that are represented. Some of you might be having the best week of your life. You know, you got the job promotion, things are going well, whatever it might be. We praise God for those things because He is a God who gives us good blessings and we want to celebrate that. But we know that there are also people who come in this, this room every week with heavy hearts and with hard situations and circumstances. And I know it because I've been one of those people that have walked in here, that has stepped on this stage with hard things and a heavy heart. And... Um, there's nothing better we can do in those moments than to come together and to worship and to be reminded of who our God is, our good and faithful God. And as we were preparing for today, our hearts were just um, met with so much hope in James 1, and I want to read a little bit of it for you guys. It says this, Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. And it goes on in verse 12, it says this, Blessed is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And I love that reminder because we don't endure because it's fun. We don't choose to have hard things in life just for the heck of it. We know that what's coming at the end of this is the crown of life and getting to spend eternity with our Savior. That is our aim. That is our goal. So in the midst of those valleys, in the midst of the mountaintops, we get to worship a God who is good and who we get to spend the rest of our lives with. And that is our hope. That is why we sing. So if you're coming in today and you have a heavy heart, and these are hard words for you to sing, let us sing them over you. Let these words wash over you, just receive them today. Maybe you're coming in and you're having a great day and that's awesome. Let's take this time to sing these words over our brothers and sisters who maybe can't today. We're gonna continue to worship. Let's give our God praise. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same god who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out oh yes i will lift you high in the
words it is well with my soul because as believers and as children of God we have a hope that is eternal a future that is eternal and a joy that is eternal amen amen we are gonna spend time in prayer so you can have a seat I love the verses that Chels just shared with us a few minutes ago and I just want to share them one more time it says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And I love this promise. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Every time I read that, I'm so encouraged that we have a God that is so accessible. We have a God that says, if you lack something and you need something, then ask me and I will generously give it to you. I know your need and I meet the need. And I know there's many people in this place that are going through trials and tribulations and hard things. 
And the hope is that we don't have to go through it alone and we don't have to wear that burden alone because we have a God that says, hey, you're hurting, you need something, ask me and I've, I've got you, I'm with you. Um, and so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna spend the next few moments going to God, asking him, maybe you need joy, maybe you need wisdom or peace or patience through this trial. And we're gonna ask him for help. And maybe you're not someone that's needing any of those things through something, but you know someone that is. Let's go to prayer on behalf of those people and behalf of our friends and our family. So let's do that together now. just spend a couple moments praising our God in our own words, thanking Him that He is a God that has open hands and hears us and knows our need and meets our need. He's been faithful before. He will be faithful again. And let's just praise Him now.
Father, we worship you. You are such an amazing creator. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus on a rescue mission for wretched sinners like us. Jesus, we give you all the praise that we can muster today, but the truth is we could sing from now and forever, and we would still not be able to give you all the praise that you are due. Be pleased by our worship. Holy Spirit, thank you for dwelling within your people and empowering us to worship in spirit and in truth. Thank you. Jesus, we love you. We worship you. We praise you. It's in your name that we pray all of these things. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for worshiping with, worshiping with us today. Why don't you have a seat? And then go ahead and turn your attention to the screens. We've got a wonderful story of life change to share with you this morning. The facts of February and March, we just stopped going places. We started wearing masks. The streets were empty. I was spending way too much time in the news. I was watching the news for like three to four hours a day. With the shutdowns, it pretty much put life on pause the way I wanted to live it. As time went on and it began to get real, people got more fearful and, and more scared. It was like a movie, an apocalypse, with the strangest invisible reason, germs, something that we couldn't see but we were afraid of. And I think that's what's so frightening. So we were afraid of everything. I had a difficult start to the beginning of 2020. I'd been having troubles for years, and uh, through a series of unfortunate events, I really kind of hit rock bottom. My life was slowly unraveling, but I certainly didn't want to admit anything. I was very proud and alienating my wife and my children and traveling down the road of depression. I grew up in a, I wouldn't say a Christian family, but we believed in, in the Christian God and Jesus was a great guy. And that was about it. I grew up my whole life in the church, not really knowing what it meant to have a relationship with Jesus. Like, I believed in Jesus, but I wanted to live for myself. I've always been one foot in, one foot out. Everything that I would look to wouldn't satisfy. It was all counterfeit. I woke up motivated to get further ahead in life and all COVID did was tear that down. It affected how I do business immediately. It affected my clients, my income. There have been some heartbreaks. My cousin's husband got COVID in July and passed in September. She's now a widow. I live alone and loneliness is a real thing. When my small group stopped meeting, those people are real important to me. So it was really just missing people. I was meeting with my friend back in April, and he had called me out for how I was living. He was telling me, like, okay, do you know what it means to be a Christian? 
Being a Christian is being an ambassador for Christ. I thought about it like, okay, if I'm living the way I'm living, if I'm blending in with the culture, how would a non-believer know what Jesus looked like? How am I doing that by the way I'm living? It was at that moment that I realized I have to choose, I can't serve two masters. I remember going home and praying, and that's where I gave my heart to Jesus. I, I prayed that he would give me a heart for him and that I would seek him and seek a relationship with him. I was part of a group. They talked about God and Jesus a lot. Not having any way to turn, I started to learn about what they were talking about. I am a pretty good researcher, so I started talking to people I know. Uh, I started researching on the internet. I began to read the Bible, look for information on, you know, historical accuracy. Why don't they believe in Jesus? With all this overwhelming evidence, I wanted to hear proponents, I wanted to hear opponents. Why do people think the Bible is written by man and not inspired by God? Is it inspired by God? All these sorts of questions. And I was able to piece together what I felt and believed, but I actually felt God God's presence during this time. I really had these moments where I just felt that I was going in the right direction and knew I was on the right path. And I felt so desperate. I just remember praying. I wanted God in my life. I wanted to change my life. I needed help. I admitted that I was broken. I submitted, I let go. And I began to notice changes in myself, uh, the way, you know, I would, I would talk, the things I think about, the way I behave. I didn't start fighting these urges, they were becoming natural. Even with the pandemic and all the drama and upset and uncertainty of this year, God has been stirring in me this desire to move as a missionary to where Muslims are migrating into post-Christian Europe. We let go of, you know, gym memberships. We let go of restaurants. We let go. We've let go of a lot of things. What I've learned this year is that I can let go of even more and serve God abroad. I don't have to be a genius to go and serve in another country. I just need to show up and be willing uh, to listen to the Holy Spirit and to serve, sharing the gospel, sharing the good news, being God's hands and feet. I mean, we have no greater calling. And we know that for those who love God, all things all work. things work together for good. Or good for those who are called according to His purpose. In hindsight, it has been really cool to see how God used seemingly bad things like COVID or struggles politically or my own sin struggles and how my friend called me out. God used all of those things to bring me closer to Him. He brought me to repentance and faith in Him. I saw benefits of the season that I couldn't have anticipated. I just can't wait to go. The thing I'm most grateful for in the last year was finding Jesus, my Lord and Savior, and committing my life to Him. Such incredible stories of, of the way God is still working in all circumstances. Uh, well, good morning, church. My name is Graydon. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Canyon Hills. And I've been here just shy of two years, so I don't know everybody yet. I'm still kind of new. Let me give you a brief snapshot of me. I'm, uh, some of you might recognize me from doing baptisms um, over the last couple months. Others of you might have been to a Young Marrieds event or... Some of you might have even come to a, one of my School of Discipleship classes that I've taught. I absolutely love diving into God's Word and studying theology, so much so that I went to four years of school to study the doctrine of the Trinity and absolutely loved it. Uh, I'm married to my high school sweetheart, Aaron, and we've got two absolutely wonderful kids. And over the last two weeks, Aaron and I have been enthralled in doing something probably a lot of you have been doing. We've been watching the Olympics. Has anyone else been watching Olympics? Just a few. Okay, great. Well, we love the Olympics. We love watching people who have dedicated their lives to becoming the best at something. And one of the things that we've been watching quite a bit is volleyball. And I've noticed something about the U.S. women's volleyball team that Everybody on the team is very different. You've got the outside hitter who can jump a mile high and slam a spike down a million miles an hour against the other team. 
And then you've got the defensive blockers who are like seven feet tall and super tough to just stand there and take the slamming spike. You've got the, the setter who never scores a point on her own, but she is integral in setting up the rest of the team to win. And then in the back, you've got someone who's usually a, like two or three feet shorter than everyone else on the team, who's defense, and they are diving after the ball and trying to save the team from losing points. Every teammate needs to be in their position and giving their all to belonging to the team in order to win. We're going to be talking this morning about what it means to belong to one another. And I think this image of teamwork at an Olympic level is helpful in framing this kind of unity among differences that the Bible is talking about. So let's dive in. If you have your Bibles, uh, open them up or pull your phones out and open up to Romans chapter 12. But before we read this passage, I'm going to start with a little bit of context. But bear with me. Uh, Context doesn't mean, okay, now you can go to sleep. But this is important stuff. And if you've ever taken a class with me, you'll hear some things I like to say over and over again. And one of them is that I like to look at scripture in big chunks. So when I found out that I was going to be preaching on a small section of the book of Romans, I wanted to zoom back out and see how that passage fits into the book as a whole. I find this incredibly helpful, both for preparing things like this, but also just in my daily walk with Christ as I'm reading God's word. And if you've ever sat in the front row of a movie theater, you know why this is important. Not just because it hurts your neck to look up at an IMAX screen, but also if you're only able to see one corner of the screen, you miss out on how that fits into the rest of the story. You might see in great detail the very corner of someone's foot, but you don't know why that fits into the rest of the story. So that's what I want to do this morning. I want to set back a little bit and look at how our passage this morning fits into this letter that Paul wrote to the Christians living in Rome. Now, Paul wrote to the Roman believers in a time of disunity. So bear with me for one minute of history, all right? In the Roman church, you had the Jewish Christians and the non-Jewish Christians. Up until the emperor got rid of all of the Jews, he expelled all the Jews out of Rome for five years, And so when that happened, the church in Rome was only the non-Jewish believers. But after those five years, after the church had developed and grown for a little bit, the Jews were allowed to return back to Rome. But when they got back to Rome, they found that the church in Rome was very non-Jewish, mostly in the way that they lived out their faith. And this caused, as you can imagine, incredible conflict and disunity as they were asking questions like, Should we keep the Sabbath like good Jews? Or do we need to be circumcised like good Jews in order to be Christians? The church was incredibly divided over some of these issues. And so Paul is writing into this context when he gives us the beautiful picture of the gospel that we get in the book of Romans. Now, quick word about Paul. Paul likes to write his letters in two parts. The first is the what the what of the gospel. What has Jesus done? Who are you in Christ? And then the second part is the now what? Act like it. Act like you are already in Christ. And in the chapters leading up to our passage this morning, Paul gives us the what, the content of the gospel. He beautifully and clearly presents the gospel in a way that some people like to call the Romans road, showing us that All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And whoever confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead, they will be saved. Many of you have those verses memorized and you've walked people through the Romans road before. This is the gospel. This is the reason we're all here. And all of this in Romans, Romans 1 through 11, leads us now to the now what? The change that Paul's expecting based on the truth of the gospel. Okay, you still with me? I'm seeing a few people asleep. Okay, here, <laughs> the reason that I'm sharing all of this is because this is important. 
This five-week series on being the church is not a recruitment pitch. This is not the issue of our church having these needs and we're desperate for help and begging you, please come help us, we need your help. This series is the now what of the gospel. This is our part to play after we've been saved, after we've encountered Jesus Christ and been changed and transformed. This is what we now do. So here we are in chapter 12 at the big turning point in the book of Romans. We're moving from the what to the now what, and Paul says this. Let's all stand for the reading of God's word. Romans chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the gift of your word, for providing a way for us to know you and know how to respond to you. Lord, move me aside this morning and speak to all of us through your word by your Holy Spirit. Allow us to see your face and be changed. We ask this in the precious name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So verse five says, so we though many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. I love the way that the NIV says this. It says, so in Christ, we though many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. Each member belongs to all the others. As members of the body of Christ, you and I are on the same team. We belong to one another. We need to be using all that God has given us in order to serve one another. This was an issue in the Roman church at the time with their conflict, and it can be an issue for us today too. You don't have to look hard to see how different we all are. I mean, even if you just look at the way that each of us individually responded to COVID in the last year and a half, you can see we are all very, very different but those differences shouldn't lead to disunity. Paul's remedy for this disunity, when he saw disunity in the church, his remedy was the gospel of Jesus Christ. And our response to that gospel is belonging to one another. Now, I already, already said that I like studying the doctrine of the Trinity. So this morning I have three points. I like threes. Your first point this morning is belonging to one another reflects the unity of the triune God. Belonging to one another reflects the unity of the triune God. This belonging that we have is core and foundational to our very identity as the church. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul's again speaking about the gifts of the Spirit, and his emphasis also there is about using our differences to build one another up. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Do you see what Paul's doing here? As someone who loves studying the doctrine of the Trinity, I love verses like this, where you see all three persons of the Trinity next to each other, different and yet working together, different and yet united. Paul is laying out for us here that even though we have differences in our gifts, in our services, in our activities, those different positions on the team are God-given to build us up. 
by using our differences to build one another up, we are reflecting the glory of God. So if you follow Christ, you need to be working in unity with the body of Christ, the church. Christianity is not a spectator sport. You can't be a Christian and not be a part of the Christian community. I'm not talking necessarily about restrictions that were in place during COVID here, but long before COVID, I knew people, even people at Bible college, who said they really like Jesus, but they don't like Christians. They like Jesus, they follow Jesus, but they're not a part of the church. This is backwards and frankly unbiblical. The reality is that God is relational and so are we. No Christian is an island. God made us relational like him. So by definition, the members of the body of Christ belong to one another in relationship. This goes beyond the people sitting next to you here And beyond, heaven forbid, the people who attend the other services. (laughs) But it goes beyond the people at this church and beyond this area. It's everybody in the world who is a follower of Christ, who is truly in Christ. We all are a part of the big C global church and we all belong to one another. We need to be reflecting in a small way the unity of God in the way we are united in working towards the mission of God. So if you call yourself a follower of Christ, you need to be involved in the work of the ministry. And that ministry work is not relegated to people who have it in their title or who get a paycheck for doing this. Ephesians 4.12 says that the job of pastors and elders is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That's all of us. We are all the saints, You are the saints. You are the ones called to do the work of the ministry. It's the job of the pastors and elders to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And let me be honest, we do a really good job of doing that here. We make sure that no one who signs up to serve does so ill-equipped. We will train you. We will equip you. We will make sure you know exactly what to do and how to get support as you are serving God here. So I really want to encourage you to think about ways you can get involved. And that brings us to point number two, which is belonging to one another builds up the church. Belonging to one another builds up the church. That first point might be the most foundational and core to who we are, but the second point is certainly the most practical. By truly belonging to one another and serving one another, we build up the church. Whenever Paul talks about differences among the body of Christ, whether that's with gifting or with roles or whatever it might be, he always talks about those differences as being for the purpose of building up the church. To finish Paul's sentence in Ephesians 4.12, leaders are called to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ. And he goes on later to say, the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. The purpose of our gifts, the reason God made us different is to work together, to build each other up. 1 Peter 4.10 says it this way, as each has received a gift, Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. The gifts that we've been given aren't to make us great. And they're not actually even particularly for us to enjoy. These aren't the Christmas presents of a toddler who refuses to share them with other people. I have a toddler, so I know what that looks like. But our gifts were given to us so that we could share them with the body of Christ for the benefit of the body of Christ. Now, this is important. Listen here. God gives us differences so that we build each other up. God gives us differences so that we build each other up. Now, this can be done in rather spectacular, amazing, upfront, life-changing ways. And it can also be done in ways that seem on the surface kind of mundane and everyday. 
For example, after moving from this area, my wife and I went to college down in California, and then I went to seminary down there, and then we moved to Scotland, uh, where I went to even more school and studied the Trinity. Erin, by the way, if you haven't met her, is a saint. I, I definitely married up. She was willing to leave a successful career doing filming at Disneyland in sunny Southern California in order to move to Scotland, where it's not quite sunny in the same way. <laughs> we left our dual income, 20-something life in the sun in Southern California to a place where after we paid our rent and bills, we had about $125 to spend on food and everything else for the month. It was a huge difference. And not only that, but we were really nervous about going to a place that we'd never been before, where we knew nobody, where we didn't really belong. Well, when we first arrived, we pulled up to the place we were going to live, and our landlords, Paul and Sheila, invited us to come with them to church. And it was after that first church service that we went to a church lunch with Fran and Michael at their house. And Fran and Michael fed us delicious food. They listened to us. They welcomed us into our home. And they heard that we didn't have a microwave. We couldn't afford a microwave quite yet. And so they said, why don't you just take ours? We kind of need a new one anyways. They gave some excuse about that. And then they found out that we didn't have a dryer. And we were hanging our clothes to dry outside in Scotland. <laughs> now, if, I, I hear you laughing. If, if you've ever... If, if you've never dried your clothes outside in Scotland, let me just give you a picture. Have you ever tried to wear cardboard as underwear? <laughs> then you know exactly what it feels like. So Fran and Michael, they offered to let us use their dryer whenever we wanted to, which was incredible. So once a week for a few months, we bagged up our recently washed, still wet clothes, at least the ones we didn't want to put on as cardboard. And we walked a few streets over to their house and we used their dryer. It was a small thing for them, but it was huge for us. First, because we got to put warm, dry clothes on, but also we got to spend an hour, which usually extended into hours of time with them. They became our best friends in Scotland. They became our family. We started to feel like we belonged because they had served us so well. But we didn't truly feel like we belonged until we started serving ourselves. We started serving the community. We got involved and committed to using our gifts and our time and our talent in order to build up the church community there in Scotland. We didn't have much while we were in Scotland, but because of the belonging that we experienced with the body of Christ there, our time there was incredibly rich. So building up the body of Christ can be a seemingly small thing like that, like sharing your dryer with someone else. It can also be something that collectively can drastically change the direction of someone's life. Uh, two years ago, almost this exact week, my, my whole family, uh, which hasn't lived in the same state together for almost 20 years, we all got together and spent some excellent, well-needed time together as a family. Um, we're actually going to do that again starting tomorrow. We're really excited. They're all coming back into town starting tomorrow. We're going to spend a week enjoying each other. And now we've all got kids, so we're all going to have a lot of fun. But my older sister, Brittany, is strong and self-sufficient. She's the kind of person that has always given back to the church and to the work of God. She's also incredibly kind and caring. Um, she was always a really great older sister to me, and now she's a wonderful wife and mom of two. But during that trip two years ago, the day after we celebrated her son's second birthday and had this big party, she started complaining about headaches and eventually got bad enough that her husband, my brother-in-law, convinced her to head to urgent care. And that urgent care visit extended as they discovered viral meningitis and a swelling in her brain. Those led to extreme seizures, an induced coma, and staying for a couple weeks at Swedish in Seattle. There were days when I really didn't think I'd ever get to see my sister again. It was an incredibly difficult, painful season for our whole family to walk through. But we were amazed at the way that God showed up 
And one of the best ways he showed up was through the body of Christ. Immediately when people heard what had happened to Brittany, they sprang into action. We had an army of helpers and support. We had people doing shifts all day and all night to care for their five-month-old baby and to feed her and put her back to sleep and burp her. We had people who were helping to play with her two-year-old son and take care of him. We had people who came out of the woodwork to help raise financial support to cover the expensive bills that they were going to face. People raised tens of thousands of dollars so that at the end of all this, their family didn't have any debt because of hospital stays or travel or childcare or physical therapy or any of that stuff. They had a meal train that lasted for weeks and weeks on end. They had prayer support all day, every day, encouragement from the body of Christ. Well, Brittany ended up getting to get out of the hospital, praise God, and I get to see her again tomorrow. I'm super excited about that. But it was because of the body of Christ that this family, our family, was able to come out of this season of life surrounded by the love of Christ and built up. This is the way the body of Christ is supposed to work, right? When there's a need, the body of Christ hears about it and springs into action and builds each other up and fills those needs, When we have an encounter with the living God, when we see Jesus face to face and we experience the gospel, like in Romans 1 through 11, we immediately are entered into this family where we belong to one another. And our response is serving one another. Psalm 133 verse 1 says it this way, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. This is so true, isn't it? Many of you have your own stories of ways that the body of Christ has shown up for you, the ways that you have belonged to the church. I saw this here at Canyon Hills in incredible ways, especially in life groups during the COVID season. We had some people who had been in careers for 30 years and 2020 was the year they were forced into early retirement. We had people losing jobs. We had people going through pay cuts and sicknesses and not to mention the additional strain of always being at home, which now also became the office and the school for our kids. It was an intense time of life in addition to the normal highs and lows of everyday life. But I was amazed to see how, especially in our life groups, life groups banded together to offer support and care for and build up the people in their groups that were in need. But I've also known that some of you have felt really isolated during this time, during this COVID pandemic season. You stayed distant for a long time, either for your own health reasons or out of a desire to protect the health of other people around you. And maybe you haven't really felt like you belong here or anywhere. Well, I really want to encourage you to invite you to serve, to get involved, to belong. We need you. Not because you are so great, although I'm sure you are. I've met some of you and you're great. But it's not because you're so great that we need you. It's because we belong to one another. And God gave us differences so that we could build each other up. We need you because we belong to one another. And that brings us finally to point number three, which is that belonging to one another is the vehicle for the gospel. Belonging to one another is the vehicle for the gospel. In John 17, when Jesus had finished the Last Supper and he was giving his last prayer before going to the cross, what did he pray for? He didn't pray for amazing leadership in the church or for a Christian utopia where the government always did Christian things. He didn't pray for a world without pain or disease or loss or betrayal. He didn't pray for comfort or an easy life for his followers. No, he prayed for unity in the church. John 17, 23 sums up his thoughts. When he's praying, he prayed to God and says, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Jesus prayed that we would be one, that we would belong to one another in order to show the world that God loves them to show the world what true belonging really looks like. God gives us our differences so we can build each other up, but God gives us unity to further the gospel. 
Let me say that again. God gives us our differences to build each other up. And God gives us our unity so that we can further the gospel. Belonging to one another is the mark of the church. We are a group of very different people in so many respects. We, we look different. We act different. We like different styles of music. We order different things at Taco Bell, or we don't even go to Taco Bell. We vote differently. We do things very differently. We're so different, but we can still get along and work toward the same goal because of who we are in Christ. And that belonging is the very thing that shows the world that Jesus loves them. John 13, 35, by, all, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. God could have individually revealed himself to each person without the aid of the Bible or the aid of the church, but he chose us to bring the gospel to the world. And this has always been his plan. Even back in Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis 22 with Abraham, God said that he would bless the world through Abraham's family. God has always used people to further his kingdom. We are the hands and feet of God moving the gospel out and we need to be in step with one another. When we belong, we show the world that Jesus loves us and can love them too and does love them too because belonging is what everybody wants, right? The rest of the world just doesn't know where to find it. I mean, to be known and to be loved, to truly belong with other people are the deepest desires that we have as humans. And there are really two places that you can look for that. You can look for belonging in Christ, in the global church, being a part of the big C church with the body of Christ. Or you can look for it in any number of the world's groups. That's why there are thousands of Facebook groups, each specific for a different thing. Did you know, I kind of like this one. Did you know there's a Facebook group called Friends Don't Let Friends Wear Crocs? I kind of like that. I apologize if anyone in here is wearing Crocs to church, but there's actually an inordinate number of Facebook groups about Crocs. I don't know why. Either really positive or really negative. There's no kind of middle of the road when it comes to Crocs. But it doesn't just happen on Facebook, right? There are groups of people who their identity is the way that they vote in political reasons, or it is in neighborhood groups, that live close together, or groups of people who watch the Olympics together, or a show together. And let's be honest, this desire to belong anywhere, somewhere where we feel accepted, that desire to belong is why the LGBTQ community is as close-knit as it is, even if it is founded on something shallow and sinful. It's a place where people feel like they belong where they don't belong anywhere else. But just belonging somewhere isn't enough. You can belong anywhere, but all of those other groups are shallow, empty, fragile, and they'll come to an end, some much more quickly than others. It's only those of us who are in Christ, who belong to Christ and therefore belong to one another. That belonging is a belonging that lasts. And when it's done right in community, that kind of eternal belonging is incredibly attractive. So our belonging ought to be attractive, a kind of belonging that helps to bring the gospel to the world. Okay, so that's all my what. Now let me give you my now what. So I have three, again, I'm a Trinitarian theologian. I have three points for you for now what. The first is build up. Use your gifts, your skills, your talents, your resources. Use the things that make you different and unique to build up this body of Christ. We have so many opportunities for you to use your gifts here, to belong here. In addition to our normal service needs, I know you've heard this a hundred times already. I'm going to say it again. We're starting a fourth service back up again in September, in just a couple weeks. But just starting a fourth service opens up 600 new volunteer positions. 
Uh, some of you have already signed up to help volunteer in a new way, but we still have quite a few needs. Um, I'll put some of those up on the screen here. We've got um, 50 needs still for kids' ministry, for children's ministry, 75 for our first impressions team, 25 in adults, and 25 in student ministries. It doesn't have to be some glamorous, flashy, upfront, big pressure thing in order for it to build up the church. We need people who are willing to mow the lawns of elderly widows. We need people who care about the next generation enough to teach in Sunday school or hold babies so that parents can come and feel safe when they come and worship. We need people who are willing to lead others and lead life groups. People who are committed to making more and better disciples of Jesus Christ. We have a variety of ways that you can sign up to do this. Um, the first is out there, you've all seen the carnival, <laughs> the carnival booths that are out there. Um, go out there and chat with the people over there. They'll answer your questions. They'll help you get signed up. You can also go to our website, canyonhillscommunitychurch.com slash serve to see a bunch of opportunities there. And also, if you have the app on your phone, we made it really easy. We put in big words at the top of the app, tap here to serve. So trying to make it simple for you to sign up. So first, build up, build up the church. Second, bring up, bring up the gospel with your non-believing friends and family. This is a really hard one for a lot of us, but we need to be willing to show other people what it looks like to belong to the body of Christ. We need to invite our non-believing friends, family members, neighbors, baristas, anybody we come in contact with to come and witness what true belonging actually looks like in Christ. And finally, build up, bring up, and also come up. If you have something you want prayer for this morning, I want to invite you at the end of this service to come on up and talk to the people who will be waiting here to pray. And that might be a need that you have. You might be really struggling right now, and you want someone to pray with you over that. Or you might be in a really good season and you want to praise God for all that he's doing. And I invite you to come up as well. Or maybe even you want to know a little bit more about what it looks like to belong to Jesus Christ, to follow Jesus. I want to invite you to come up at the end of service. In addition to that, if you have specific needs that need to be met, we can't meet those at the church unless we know about them. So if you're in a life group, bring up those needs with your life group. Or if your life group isn't able to help care for those needs, we want to know about it as the church. And so we want to invite you also to go to our website, canyonhillscommunitychurch.com, click on I'm new, even if you're not, and fill out the I have a need form. That way we can partner you up with our member care team and help take care of those needs. Okay, so because of the gospel, we belong to one another. And our response is to build up the church. I want to invite you all to do that in this next week and in making a commitment to do that in the coming months and years in your service, not only here at Canyon Hills, but as a Christian and a follower of Christ, a part of the body of Christ. Let's pray. Father God, I ask that you would move in our hearts, that our prayer today would be the same as that of Jesus Christ, that we would be one. Help us to belong first to you and then to your body, the church. Give us humility, courage, and unity to serve those around us. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Let's be the church.